store last evening that a friend of ours has here close by. And there were neck forms that just had the pieces hanging on them. And what that male owner of that store didn't realize, and I think Allison actually brought it to his attention, was that the neck form simulated what the woman felt like she would look like wearing those individual pieces. You're demonstrating how the merchandise will look on you. And if you demonstrate the merchandise or present the merchandise, then people are going to see it certainly very differently. In addition to that, by having a premeditated intention on how you display the case, this impacts where you put it in the showcase um, and how you display it. <coughs> this happened to be a store that's been very successful, and, and we went in and they were saying, well, we're just not selling enough of this merchandise as we'd like to be. Well, I think it's pretty obvious if you take fine jewelry that you're going to sell on the premise of the sizzle and all the craftsmanship and hard work and precious metals that went into it, and you display it in this way, you're running against yourself. So it's something you don't want to do. In addition, when you are setting up the showcase, always remember that the area at the back of the showcase is where people's eyes go first. And we'll talk about that in one of the upcoming mistakes. But try to look at where things are in the case and how people go about making a decision on, on what they're going to buy. One other aspect of this, uh, one of the reasons that I affiliated my new firm with the Edge Retail Group is that we're now taking the data that you could get from Focus or from Edge or from, uh, from Big, whomever might have your, your in-store software. We can take that data and extrapolate from that data what you're selling and at what price points you're selling and consequently look at whether or not how should we display items to increase that average sale. If your average sale coming out of a particular case is $450, and we want to increase the overall store sales by 20%, mm -hmm. then, then ideally, we have to increase that showcase from 450 to, to uh, 550, whatever the numbers turn out to be. So realizing that we have goals and aspirations by case, in addition to, uh, and we have a plan for it, is, is, is a key factor. Building on this idea of uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I need to bring up the point. One of the things that is a, a, an immediate step towards making this simpler for you is to establish some better record keeping. Take a photograph of what every one of the showcases in the store looks like on the first of the month. And then the first of the next month, take another photograph of what it looks like. The goal behind that is when you're sitting down a couple of months down the road and you saw that you had a spike in your pearl sales or a drop in your colored stone sales, it might be advantageous to be able to go back and say, well, what did I look like that month? What did my pearl case look like the month that we had such a great month? And what did we sell within it? So by having records and having some type of a history, when you're getting ready to do Mother's Day in 2015, if you know what Mother's Day 2014 looked like, you have more to work from. Um, there are people who say that you, know, you have to have these records and you have to have some way to measure what you do. It's important that we're able to keep track of what something looks like so we know what we can do better about it the next time. Number nine, not knowing your targeted sales and profits per foot of showcase selling space. What does that mean? What that means is, and on your handout, if you have one, and if you don't, let me know and I'll get you one, but they're all over the room here. Let's try this exercise. If you were to take the total dollars in merchandise sales that you had in your store in 2013, that doesn't include appraisals, probably shouldn't include your Pandora sales, uh, it doesn't include repairs. It's just what did we sell out of the case? And then secondly, if we were to add up how many running feet of showcase do we have in the store? We have 10 six foot cases, then the average is the, the number is 60 feet. Now, if we divide that million dollars in sales by the 100, sorry, go here to be a little easier. If we take the half a million dollars in sales, divided by the 50 feet of showcase space, we'll come down to the idea that in order for us to maintain that existing level of sales, it's an important differentiation to do the same amount that we did the year before. We have to sell on an average of $10,000 per foot of showcase take it a step further. If our average gross margin is 50%, which is about what Jay said, we need to make 
$5,000 a foot just to stay where we are. So when you're walking the floor down here and you see a vendor display that's this big and it comes with all this merchandise and you say, boy, that would really be great, that would look good in my store. If it's three feet wide and it's this store, you better make $15,000 a foot to stay even with where you are to make it uh, worth its while. You only have a limited amount of showcase space with which to run your business. That's why people get into the area of wall cases and countertop units and floor units and things that artificially expand how much selling space you have. I'm not a big believer of a lot of those things that I just mentioned to you, so what I like to suggest instead is that we do a better job of focusing the limited amount of in-case fine jewelry showcase space we have to do more with that rather than try to go get more and more space that we might not be using effectively. So this basis is not, it's not a quota, it's not a goal, it's not an absolute, certainly not. It's not something where we say you can't do more than this. What it really is, is a guideline to say that when you're looking at pearls or you're looking at men's jewelry or you're looking at color in your store and trying to decide how much space to use, you use it as a guideline that this is an average. If you want your store business to grow by 20%, then we need to sell $12,000 per foot. There was a client of mine last year that was based here in Chicago that had about 100 stores. And that particular store had 40% of their showcase space was watches. And I asked the owner there, you know, how's your watch business? He said, watch business is great. He said, we're now up to 6% of our sales are watches. And I just asked about the incongruity of exactly what he had just said. 6% of his sales are watches, 40% of his showcase space is watches. So I asked the question, I said, great, which brand is selling the best? He said, my pre-owned Rolex is about half of that 6%. So we went over to that case, the pre-owned Rolex was in a space this big. 40% of his store was watch displays, and 3% of the business was done in the amount of it outside that pre-owned Rolex area. What's the moral? The moral is, is there really, is that an effective and efficient use of the limited amount of space you have? Will you be better off reducing that and growing the more profitable areas that made up the other 60% of this volume? I don't know. But you better ask yourself that question because that's the reality of what's going on in the store. Number eight, let's get into some specifics. Using the wrong trade densities for the relative value of the merchandise. It's very important that we realize that when people buy jewelry, they do it in a comparative environment. They're comparing you with the guy down the street. They're comparing this ring with this ring. And how we present things has considerable impact on the perceived value of that piece. So I hit upon kind of a simple formulation that I call the 20-40-40 principle. And that is that we want to take top 20% of the merchandise in any given showcase, and we want to display it on individual elements. It's the best. We're going to do something that could be interpreted as good, better, best. We're going to take that best, and we're going to present it like it is the best. We're going to take the next 40%, that mid-priced merchandise, and we're going to display it in trays that hold three because it's not the best and it's not the lowest, it's what's in the middle. And keep in mind, and we have this discussion a lot, you can't have great, if you, if you can't have first place unless there's a second and third place. You can't have tall unless you have short. If everybody is six foot tall, then there's no such thing as a tall person. The only way that can be the best is if something is not as good as that. So what this does is visually, by putting the, the bottom 40%, and trades that hold more. Now what we've done is we've created good, better, and best. And the placement in this case is not accidental. When I walk up to this case and someone looks in this particular vignette, this area right here is where they look first. Now this happens to be a client who moved this tray up there. Let's just focus on this. When the client looks at that piece, when the customer looks at that piece, that's the area they look at first in the case. And when they look at this piece first, then they can scan down to this and down to the front. One of the problems with trays very close to the front of the case 
is that in order to shock them, you either have to walk up very close and look down, or worse than that, how many times have you in your store seen somebody back up and bend over and look through the front of the case? There's a great book by a guy named uh, Hucko Underhill called Why We Buy. And he says, if you force your customer to stand or to shop in an uncomfortable manner, they're going to leave the store. And I don't think anybody likes to bend over with their backside out in the aisle looking through the front of the case to see something as wonderful as fine door. So consequently, this 20-40-40 rule makes a big, and this was one of the major changes that we made at the store in Oklahoma that I mentioned to you before. We simply regrouped the merchandise together into clusters that matched what we were going to say about it. We were going to tell this customer who was feeding at a price point that was a little lower, who's probably not used to having a whole lot of selection in his life. I tell you, you got $1,000 to go buy a car. You can't be very picky about what kind of car it is you buy. So consequently, when you're used to shopping in a more budget-oriented price point, you like it when someone tells you, have, you have, that you have a broad selection. So the sales associate here, finding out that this customer is needing to spend a lesser amount of money can go to that person and say, look at all these choices we have for you. But when the person comes in who is shopping for something more unique and is in this top 20% and is willing to spend that money, now I sell the individuality, I sell the uniqueness, I sell the one of a kind, I sell the best, I have all the adjectives at hand because this is the best merchandise and I'm presenting it that way. Number seven, using old, incorrect, unflattering, and improperly placed lighting. It's a huge mistake. Um, the lights have come an awfully long way in the last uh, in the last five or six years, and they're cons consistently evolving. Um, the, obviously, the top type of light to have is a good LED light, and, uh, and there are brands that I worked with that I didn't have particular affinity for. But what I would suggest to you is, as you're shopping LED lights, try to remember that they're not all the same, and you can use you usually make your buying decision based upon the length of warranty that they have. I suggest you don't buy anything for the store that doesn't have a commercial grade five year warranty on it. Um, LED lights change in color over a short period of time and you end up with them actually being less bright and developing coloration in them as the cheaper ones start to age. I was in a store in Vancouver Tuesday and he had bought these lights a year ago and they were already, you could see different color tones between them. Don't go buy the lights at Home Depot or Lowe's if you're gonna use them in your store. Those are residential grade, although they'll say commercial grade on them and they'll have a one year warranty on them and they just won't last. They'll be fine for the bookshelf at the house, but they're not good for being able to use them actually in your store. My recommendation is that you look at, um, oh, in the placement of it, let's talk about that a second. We find this is a great example of where individual elements are put in the showcase, but they're done in such a way that no one pays attention to where the lighting actually shines and actually hits the piece. Uh, go back through one of the rules that is so difficult sometimes to get people to do is when they're finished setting up the case, is have someone get out from behind the case, walk around the other side. Can I see everything that I'm looking at? Is the light shining on everything correctly? Do I have shadows and do I have pendants hanging off the end of the neck forms? And make certain that you're ready for business. It comes back to this idea of intention. It comes back to this idea of having premeditated thought and that I am presenting or I am demonstrating this merchandise to my client. Toward that end, I wanted to make you an offer that um, there is a pre-opening um, checklist that um, I offer, it's on my website, but if you will send me an email, my email address is on your handout, and just put the word uh, checklist in the title. I will email this to you. Uh, it's an easy form for you to uh, try to get the staff in the store to follow, to open the store every day, it just kind of gives you some hints, it tells you a little bit on how to clean some of the floorboard materials, things of that nature, but it'll help uh, in getting the store ready for prime time. Here's an example of the lights that I was talking about. Uh, you definitely want to have the, uh, have the commercial grade 
you want 5,000 Kelvin uh, temperature lights over your diamonds, and you want 4,000 Kelvin over everything else. And if you want to see the difference in that, there is one vendor here, uh, Econolite, uh, Howard Gurdock, uh, has some lights that will show you exactly how this works. And uh, stop by and see Howard. Um, I've, had, I've had good success there. And just be careful how you aim them. Number six, an awfully lot of places we go these days have wall monitors in them where you can't hardly help but, uh, but look up at the wall at what's being shown on the television screen. There was one at the restaurant at the airport in Dallas yesterday. You're trying to have a nice lunch and you just can't seem to keep from looking up there. Uh, there are wall monitors in the dentist's office and the vet's office and everywhere. A lot of my friends who have stores tell me that they don't like to use them very much because they don't want someone looking up at the monitor. They want people looking down inside the showcase. I understand the value in that. The only difference is I think there's an opportunity using those wall monitors to communicate selling points and benefits and stimulate interest in the jewelry that we have. So if that wall monitor turns into a sales tool, it's not a distraction. It's actually using the media to be able to bring people into the store. Toward that end, I wanted to show you some examples of uh, a business um, I founded that uh, actually produces the slideshows, but it shows you some ideas of what can be done on those monitors where you might be promoting uh, any affiliations that you have or start uh, bringing to the customer's attention some of the merchandise that you have available in the store. And again, if you don't want to order these from uh, mystoremonitor.com, get a local college student or somebody to put these together for you so that they emphasize the selling points that are indigenous to your store and touch the hot buttons of the, of the clientele that, that's coming in. Um, the way that this service provides them, uh, they do it with uh, a new slideshow every month so that you get Halloween-related items as well as each month promoting the book shows things of that nature. And obviously promoting the brand names that you might carry in the store. Obviously they're personalized when store my store monitor does them, they're done with the clients name right here. And different aspects of what you do in your store that brings value to your customer. This is promoting the Antwerp trips and uh, again, traveling the world to get uh, that. And then promoting young couples that have ordered and bought their wedding rings in your store. If you don't have a camera in the store, and if you don't take a photograph of every time a couple buys an engagement ring and they're all happy, and take a photograph of them with that ring in front of your logo, you're missing a real opportunity. Uh, we have one client for this mystoremonitor.com service where uh, that's all the show is, is a continuous series <coughs> of couples, and it's a small town. People come in and, oh, they recognize this person, and it just creates the monitor into an additional reason to buy. If you're interested in that, I want some suggestions on what you could do. Uh, you can speak to me. I'll be happy to give you some ideas on it. I have brochures on the service uh, as well. So using, I'll uh, give her more than just flowers this year. So using the store monitor is a, a good way of taking that medium that the younger demographic target is used to seeing in, uh, in bars and nightclubs and everywhere at the, at the gym and everything and turning it into a, a selling experience in your store. Number five, I'm asking awfully lot about the use of vendor provided displays. These are the free displays you get from the company that sells you the merchandise. And if I believe in those being a good idea or a bad idea, well, it depends for starters on whether or not your store is built around your brand or if it's built as a boutique. The difference is a boutique is a store in which you come in and you're not really that interested in the name of the boutique. You're there because there's a Rolex they sell Rolex, they sell Omega, they sell uh, Hearts on Fire, they do Chicory, uh, they do Pandora, and you're there because you buy into those brands, not because you're necessarily buying into the store brand. That's indicative of some stores, but most stores, day in and day out, are actually building their own brand. So you have the question, would I be better off with those new pieces that I bought being in my own store display, or would I be better off in them being in the display that the guy's going to give me? free 
because I bought the line. Well, it's free is good, but free isn't always free. What I would ask you to think about is a couple of different things. Number one, which brand are you more interested in promoting? Number two, is the display that you're about to get, remember our analysis of so many linear feet and the sales per foot, is the, is the display going to be the right size for the amount of space you have in your limited amount of showcase space? Is it going to take up too much room? When I was at Pacific Northern and some of the other companies, we did a lot of those. And the one that always sticks out in my mind is a guy at the JCK show in Vegas who wanted us to do this big ring, bridal ring display. And I asked him what kind of color he wanted, and he wanted a brown and an orange mm -hmm. combination. And I, I said, you know, where does that come from? And he said, because that's the color scheme of the interior of the new Porsche I just bought, and it really looks great, and it would look great with diamonds. Well, maybe. But I don't know that I want to be doing something that's going to go in your showcase that's based upon the color that that Porsche decided to do the interior of their car. So you want to make sure that it's the right color, you want to make sure that it's the right size, and you want to make sure that the style of the display is congruent with the overall image that you have in the store. There's a lot of plexiglass in it or a lot of metal in it. Does that go with the overall decor of the store? You're in a fine jewelry business and it needs to look that way. So I think one of the things I would do is ask yourself long and hard, do I prefer to put this in my own brand? Are they in the store looking at this merchandise because of Joe's Jewelers? Or are they in here because of this ring I got from Larry Johnson Design Firm? In addition to that, when you're talking about a, a designer's display, if the designer is somebody that the customer comes in asking for, and honestly, you can probably name those on about five or six fingers. There are people who come in and say, I'm looking for hearts on fire, or I'm looking for sport, or I'm looking for David Durbin, or I'm looking for these areas. If I come into the store with a pre, my own intention, if I come into that store with an idea in my mind that I want to see David Durbin product, I'm going to have a higher propensity to buy if it's in a David Durbin display. If I'm in shopping for sapphires, and they come from Joe Blow Sapphire Company, that name means nothing to me. And if you really think about it, you set yourself up to have to do two sales. If those sapphires are from the Larry Johnson Sapphire Company, then the first thing probably someone's going to ask is, well, who's the Larry Johnson? And it's in the Larry Johnson Sapphire Company display. Then the question is, who's that? And now you're having to explain who the designer is. And then in addition to getting buy-in to this unknown designer, as to who he is or she is. Then you're going to sell me the sapphire on top of it. I'm in the store because of Jones Jewelers, because of your name. So if that dis merchandise is in a Jones Jeweler display, I have your credibility. I the merchandise is being carried along by the strength of your own credibility. And you don't have to do two sales. And the first one is easier because you're already in your store because he buys it to the idea that you have quality goods. So when you're thinking about these vendor displays, I would ask you to treat them uh, with a great deal of caution. Recognize that the vendor may be in one time and may be out another time, and you're going to need your own display to go in that place. But I would just, I'm not saying don't use them, I would say sit down with premeditated malice of forethought and make a decision on whether or not this is a good idea or a bad idea. One other mistake that I see happening an awfully lot that is adjunct to this that I've outlined is getting in a bridal display from a great bridal company, putting it in the showcases, and then having my own merchandise that I own sitting next to it in a display that's 12 years old. Okay, two years old. So here comes this brand new shiny display from so-and-so ring company, and maybe it's to Corey or maybe it's whomever, and I want to use it. I put it in the case. And over here next to it are some old displays that I've had since, you know, the Carter administration. And they're sitting right next to it. And all of a sudden, let me ask you a question. I walk in, I've got 10000 make it start out the show around. I've got $20,000 in my pocket. I want to buy my, my betrothed to engagement ring. Would you rather I bought a $20,000 ring out of the designer line? Or would you rather I bought a $20,000 ring out of the stuff that was your own stuff? For most people, they'd rather I bought their, their brand as opposed to the designer brand. They make a higher gross margin, 
on their own stuff than on the stuff from the court or hearts on fire. If that's the case, then imagine for a moment, if that's your preference, go back to the, what I said at the very beginning, the idea of intention, the idea of setting my merchandise in there to accomplish something that I have had, I've applied premeditated thought that I'm doing, then for goodness sake, take four or 500 bucks and buy some brand new displays for your own store brand bridal. If it's gonna go next to a brand new display from somebody else, this doesn't need to look like the cheap sister. It needs to look as nice as everybody else. Not spe featuring specific items in each one of your cases to direct your sales. This concept is really very simple. It's also called the key item concept. It comes from the idea that if I walked into your store, pulled out my American Express card, and I do this at every store that, uh, that I go to work with, and slap the card down on the top of the showcase, and I say, I'll buy anything in this case. I don't care what it is. You can try this with your staff when you get home. Here's my credit card. I'll take anything in this case. Which item would you ring up? What I hope is that they would pull an item that would be at their back side of the case, the side closest to the sales associate, in the center, like that ring we were talking about on one of the previous examples. Because that area back there is where most people are going to see. So if you, once you choose the items that you would say you want someone most to sell, that item needs to be displayed differently in the showcase than everything else. That doesn't mean you have to use a real expensive display. You can use uh, a display element that just happened to be done at Christmas, but I think it illustrates the point. You can use a display that attracts attention to it. You could use something that's happened to be three of them. But they stand out in the showcase because you've differentiated them in the case. It can also be done with a business card that says Sandy's favorite. By the way, they sold that key. It was perfect. You couldn't have asked her. We set that up in there, and by the end of the day, the, someone had bought this exact item. And guess what? Sandy had a new favorite. I think it was one of these others. <laughs> but you can put a showcase in there. You can put a business card in there that says, my personal favorite. Because remember, re I said earlier that it was comparative. It's relationship-based. They're in the store because they know you. They know your staff. They're used to coming in. And all of a sudden, they're being advised that this particular item is is your favorite, it, it takes the ball down the road. There is a, a concept, uh, it's an article in In-Store Magazine uh, I did a couple of months back on uh, the gift of uh, selection. I think that's what it was called. The gift of ideas. And if I send you the store checklist, I'll send you this too. Um, I'm sure you have your own copies of the magazine close to hand. So you can look it up and read it in there. But the essential idea behind that article was I'd gone into a Lowe's department store, not to buy lights. I'd gone into Lowe's because it was Saturday and it's just something I have to do. So I'd gone into Lowe's right before the holidays and they had organized in the, show, in the aisles all of these different gift ideas. And so if someone were looking for a holiday gift for someone else that they were going to buy at Lowe's, Lowe's is like the Home Depot of lumber and building materials, home improvement store. And they had pre-chosen about 15 different gift ideas from little birdhouses that you could build with a kid all the way up to a thousand dollar tool set. And they had a big bow on them and I could walk down that aisle and I could choose a gift that had already been pre-selected from this monstrous store. And if I was there, if I was there doing my holiday shopping, I only had to go to wrap that right there. And I happened to be on my way over to a store in Nashville, North Carolina, right after that. And they were looking for a way to bump their holiday sales. And I took the concept that I had seen at Lowe's and we applied it here. And this is an example of how it manifested. This is a sign that says, number one, forever mark diamond ring in 18 karat gold, $8,470. We went through the store and we chose 12 items that would make great holiday gift ideas. We pre-selected from everything in the whole store a dozen ideas that if I walked into this particular store and said, hi, I'm looking for a gift for my wife, the sales associate said, guess what? Here we've already chosen 12 really great gift ideas. 
unless you have something that's specific in mind, why don't I show you the 12 ideas and see if any of those work? The prices went from this to this, and the 12 items were all over the store. So if I bought into this little tour, by the time I made the lap of the store and I saw the 12 items, I knew, did I know that Wick and Green had pearls over here and men's over here and watches over here? These were all different gift ideas that had been presented as a solution to the challenge that I had put forth to the sales associate. I love the idea that she obviously was listening to me because she was trying to help me solve my problem. And Wake and Green was fortunate enough to sell quite a few items off of the list during the course of that. So guess what? They had six really great gift ideas for Valentine's. And if you go in their store now, they're preparing six really great gift ideas for Mother's Day. So if I walk in the store looking for a Mother's Day gift, guess what? We've already pre-chosen some really great ideas. In many, many instances, the person might not have bought this ring for 8400 but it prompted the conversation of the diamond ring at a higher, to hit some higher and some lower price point. So directing a key item, directing what's happening inside the showcase makes a big difference. Comes back to intention. I said in the beginning, that is the one underlying theme behind so much of visual merchandise. Taking a business card and simply putting it adjacent to something with some color and you know, creates exactly the same thing. And segues into the next item. If I were doing this whole seminar and I was doing, with, doing it without uh, slides, you'd be having to get everything that I'm telling you by orally, by my, my words to you. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just by using visuals to augment what I'm saying it increases substantially your ability to recall what we're talking about today. Same thing happens in a sales presentation in your store. If you can add visual in addition to the audio quality of any sales presentation, you increase the chances that someone's going to buy it. So you have to ask yourself, what are the unique selling points that, that I want to communicate? Um, it may be that colored stones uh, have these attributes for a subtraining as an example that would help you. This particular one is pretty clever. This is a little tent sign with citrine on this side so the customer sees it. And in the spirit of my days at the University of Texas, a cheat sheet on the back to help me remember what I want to be saying about citrine if I'm talking to someone about them. Or a bridal display that brings the graphic. In this particular design, this display brings the graphics that Blue Nile uses in your website as they begin to sequentially move a customer through the design and purchase of an engagement ring. It brings that graphic into the showcase and says, oh, did you see something that looked like that when you were shopping around on the internet last night before you came in your store? Here in our store, we speak this language too. Or a simple sign that gives you different price points to let you know what if you can afford to be shopping in that particular trade. Or this, which is proven to be beyond successful, this is a concept in which they show a particular loose stone and they put the price per month for financing. I know that doesn't ring well with an awfully lot of, uh, of people who don't like to put prices, much like much less price payments on there. But what we saw when we were testing this at a store in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, was that people actually said, well, you know, it's only 25 bucks a month more. I can have that full carrot size. And if you think about it, like it was yesterday, one of the ladies at the store said, well, that's the way I shop for things like when I'm buying a car. What's the other $10,000 or $20,000 purchase that most 30-year-olds make? Quite often, it's an automobile, and many of them don't walk in ready to drop down $42,000 for the BMW. They walk in wanting to know if it's 750 a month or 850 a month. So we're actually talking to them in a way that flows with their mindset as to how they're going to analyze it. And if you don't want to do that, that's okay. Um, there, is, I, there was one store we did where we had a small sign in the case, and we took all of the ranges of, I think it was color. And so we had 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, whatever. And we had those price points, and we showed what the payment was per month. So we didn't say this ring is $250 a month. But over here, in a place that it was obvious that if the customer 
spent a little time and looked at the case, he'd see the payments. He didn't have to ask, well, if I buy that ring, how much is it going to be per month? He could get that information from a sign that was inside the case. Let me just check my time. I've got to hurry. Okay, one of the words that I love that we don't use enough in the jewelry industry is handmade. Odds are half the merchandise in your store, or more than almost everything in your store, was handmade. Handmade is a great word. I tell you these are homemade biscuits. If I tell you this is a handmade, these are handmade shoes or a handmade suit, it conjures up warm, fuzzy emotions that help us sell. And jewelers tend to not use handmade nearly enough. Taking that concept a step further, you should have your staff sit down, or if you don't want to, you can do it, and take half an hour and listen to QVC. Don't look at how much they're selling that piece of merchandise for. Write down nothing but the adjectives. If you just write down the adjectives, and you come back to the store, and you pick two of them, it isn't, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that spectacular? Isn't that dazzling? The adjectives that they use in order to sell the quantity and of merchandise that they sell have been, are premeditated. There are adjectives that conjure up emotional responses in the people that are listening to them. So work on your own vocabulary, your selling vocabulary for the people in the store by using adjectives that have more color and have more flourish than maybe the adjectives you've been used to using. And it may be a little awkward at first, so you can start out slow. I don't want anybody hurting themselves. Just start with the word handmade and watch the pupils open up a little bit more and watch the reaction of the people. Comes to the question of how many appraisers do you have in your store? Uh, the answer is everybody who walks in the door. If I come in the door and I'm looking for, uh, let's take this example. I'm in the store, I'm shopping for $1,000, I'm looking for a birthday gift for my wife. I walk in, and let's assume there are no prices in the showcase and no payments or anything. And I come over here, and I'm looking through this case, and I see this piece that looks really nice. So I say, can I see this? And you come over, and you take it out, and it's a ruby. And you start, or maybe it should have been a citrine in honor of that sign. And you start talking to me about it. You polish it up, and you tell me that these are from Thailand, and they have a history that... Uh, you know, I have way right over my heart. My skin can't be punctured by an arrow, which comes in real handy when you live in Dallas. And so, anyway, and you start to tell me about it, and you say, isn't it just beautiful? And you hold it up, and I say, how much is it? And you say, it's $1,500. Now, my budget was 1000 and I didn't tell you that, as so many people don't. I have two choices at that time. I can either say, boy, this store is really expensive, because I'm an appraiser. I walked in looking to buy, and I wouldn't have asked you to show me that ring if I didn't think it was within my price range, unless it was just a novelty of having it on. Or I can say, either you're expensive, or I don't know hardly anything about the value of jewelry. Neither one of those two situations is conducive to me making a purchase. So my recommendation is that there are some signs in the case that guide me to an approximate price point, a range. Rings in this area run from 750 to 1250. You don't have to price each and every one, and you certainly don't do this, because all of these say 80% off. Well, they should be, because the only thing you can see on this are the signs. Be careful, but utilize the signs to augment the selling points that you would say to somebody while you're giving them the sales presentation. Just be careful with your signs that they don't communicate incorrect ideas. You can't read this. This says, delicious for Hanukkah, bonus smoked ham. Not organizing the merchandise in a way that the customer shops. I would venture to say that if I go to your, and I won't do it that way, if you were to come look in my closet, God forbid, you would see things organized by here are the shirts, here are the trousers, here's the shoes, here's the socks. It's not organized by where I bought it. It's organized by how I go in there and pull a shirt out of there because I'm going to do this or that today. But when we look at how the most people organize their showcases, quite often they organize their showcases in a way that matches where they got it. Well, those rings are all from Simon G or are all from uh, 
Kim International or they're from whomever, instead of them actually being organized in a way that matches how I shop for them. So in the store that I was telling you about in Arkansas that I started with, we started with the bridal case, which is the greatest culprit for this. The bridal case was organized, so there were displays from this guy and this guy, and that merchandise is from my friend so-and-so, and this is from these guys, and it was all over. And I walked in and I said, so if a client comes in and they're looking for an engagement ring and they're looking at halos, where do we go? Well, I show you the ones from this guy over here, and then I've got this guy's, and then these are the sign of G halos, and these over here are the other guy's halos. And I'm thinking, why am I having to walk all over the store, all over the department to see this? So we sat down instead, and we organized it by the five primary styles of the mountains. Because if you go on Jared.com, or Blue Nile, or Zale.com, and you want to look at engagement rings on those stores, on those sites, where you do not have your highly qualified salesperson there to hold their hand, you go, you start by choosing a style of a ring. And from there, there is a decision tree. Choose one of these five, and if you choose halo, then choose this, white gold, yellow gold. And there are all these decisions that bring you down to an ultimate decision. So we organized this showcase with some platforms, with these are solitaires and diamond bands, and this happened to be their color diamond inventory. And we had two of these platforms for halos because that was their most popular side. Now when somebody comes in and says, I'm looking for color diamonds, well, I have some over there, some of them. No, they're right here. And all of a sudden, the sale, as Shane Decker, who's a brilliant sales trainer, will tell you, when you start moving the client all over the store or having to leave them, or let's come over here and look at this, or let's go over there, when you start doing that, you, per, you in a linear fashion, you reduce your ability to make that sale. If I sit right here, we can make a decision based upon the inventory that you have that you want to show me. Just ask yourself when you're standing looking at how you've displayed some of the merchandise, am I displaying this in a way that is compatible with how my customer thinks when they shop? It comes back to intention. And the number one item is hiding saleable merchandise among all the proven non-saleable items. Let me ask the ladies in this room a question. So there's a brand new dress shop that opens up down the street, and you've never heard of the brand before, and you decide you're gonna go down there and see if they sell blouses. And you walk in, and you walk up to the rack, how many blouses do you look at before you decide this store doesn't have anything that I want? Anybody? I asked that question at a, this seminar two weeks ago, three weeks ago, with the IJL folks. There were 350 people in the room, and one of the answers was four, one was six, and one was 12. Now, four seems a little strong, but let's go with 12. That somebody would walk in and look at 12 blouses before they said, you know, I was there, I just didn't see anything I liked. Might be a huge store with lots of options in it. They look at 12, and make a dis determined decision that there's nothing here that I want. What I'm suggesting is that when you have a showcase full of old merchandise that has not sold and is proven not to sell, and as my colleague David Brown will tell you, if it has been in the case more than 18 months, it has a 95% chance of being in the case in five years. So you have so many bullets. You have, so, you have those 12 choices, if that's it. I walk up to a showcase that has a ton of merchandise, that's a bad example, that has a ton of merchandise in it. I got 12 shots before I say, you know, I went in that store and I just didn't have anything I wanted. So if you continue to use your 12 shots with stuff that has been proven for year after year not to sell, you're going to reduce your chance of being able to make the kind of growth that you want to see. So consequently, one of the first things I do when I see a store like this is say, let's take everything out of the case that's more than two years old, just because going to one year would be medically difficult for some people. So let's just say it's two years. We're gonna take everything out of the case that's more than two years old. Now all of a sudden, people come in, and some great little piece that was hidden among all the duds is now evident and is easy to see. And then what are you going to do with that? Well, there are lots of people, Edge and other people have programs that will help you move that merchandise and convert it in 
to the cash you need to buy the $400 worth of displays for the bridal case. But essentially, at the end of the day, don't waste your six or 12 shots with that client on items that you've proven in your own store with your own demographic to the same people who've walked past it for two and a half years that you believe in the Easter Bunny and the Good Fairy that someone's going to come by and see that ring that they've looked at or haven't really looked. They looked at the first two times they were in the store after you got it and then they stopped looking at it and you have this hope that someone's going to come in and buy it. They're not. So we're better off by taking it out of the case and doing a better job with what's viable, sellable merchandise. In closing, I want to say <clears throat> that one of the other things that if I had the time to have done 11, I would have given this the, the 11 choice. And that is try to, as you're thinking about your goals and aspirations for this store, for the store, for the rest of this year and for next year, try to envision what the store would look like if it was already doing that. Uh, there's a store I mentioned in Vancouver that's doing $2 million. I said, what do you want to do with this store? He said, I want to get to $3 million. I said, good goal. Let's see how we're going to do that. Well, you sit down and you say, what would the store look like? And how would the store look different? How would my merchandise mix look different? How would my store of training, my staff training be different? What would be different about this store other than the bank deposit if we were at three million instead of two million? And we started making the list. We visualized what the three million dollar store would look like. And then we began the steps of taking a two million dollar store and elevating it to that point. Being from Texas, there's lots of guns down there. You shoot ducks, you don't shoot where they are, you shoot where they're going. Don't visualize your store as it is. Visualize your store as you want it to be, and then begin the systematic step-by-step -step process of moving from where you are to that, and you'll get there. I'm out of time, thanks for your time. I'll be here if you have any questions. Thank you. And if you're interested, I think I have some brochures on the shoreline. Thanks again for everybody. Mm -hmm. everybody.